You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. I have uh, Dennis Fundewil. He's the co-founder and CEO of Polarix, P-O-L-A-R-I-K-S.com. So Dennis, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Hi, yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm doing quite good, thanks. Oh, good. Well, tell me about uh, Polarix. What's the uh, premise of the company? Uh, Polarix is an uh, agri-tech startup from the Netherlands, and we uh, work on a technology called hyperspectral imaging. It is basically determining the properties of an object by the reflected light. Uh, so uh, basically what we do is we have special cameras. We look mm. at plants and then by the amount of light that is reflected from a plant, say the, the green, the red, the infrared, we can establish if a plant is sick or is healthy. And this way help farmers uh, make better decisions uh, in their daily routine. How, mm, that's interesting. I mean, when plants grow, they form sometimes a canopy where they, you know, grow very close together. So how would you, um, first of all, how would you get vertically over a plant or over a field? And then how would you know when you're on one plant versus another if they grow really close to each other? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, so normally this technology is used within drone or uh, uh, aerial imagery uh, where they mostly use, look at corns or other, those kind of crops. We really specialize in, uh, in fruit, so high-value crops, going from strawberry uh, uh, strawberry farmers to even uh, grapes for uh, wine growers. And, and these are really the, the vineyard orchard types of, of agricultural fields, uh, so where crops are grown in rows. Uh, in the Netherlands, we also have a lot of greenhouses as well, which are really suited for this, uh, yeah, this, this close, close-by scanning of, of crops. Okay, so if a camera is mounted on a drone, again, what if plants are um, really close together? You know, what if you have corn and the stalks of corn literally are overlapping each other because they they get so close when they grow big? How do you know whether you're looking at one plant versus another, or is enough is it enough to just know? Okay, in this approximate location, we've got a problem and we need to look closer. Yeah. So uh, just to be clear, we're not doing uh, drones. So uh, we, we, we take more uh, robotics or stationary systems, which overlook a uh, type of field. Um, but it really depends on, uh, on the, the thing you're looking at. If you're looking at general plant health, you want to see drought stress. It is typically something that, that happens within a, a larger area. Uh, so therefore, you wouldn't even need to know if there's individual plants, but just which areas are performing better than others. Um, but if you go really to like diseases, yeah, you want to know them as soon as possible to really be uh, at the uh, frontier of uh, the outbreak. Uh, so that's really where you want to go to a more in-depth application. So uh, for us, we have a, a robot now running in vineyards that really does go through the vineyard itself and screens every plant. They immediately see, okay, there's a new vine here. What is the reflected light of this plant? And, we, and then we analyze it and say, okay, this is a healthy or this is a diseased plant. So what kinds of things can you tell using the uh, the vision? Can you see changes in the color of the leaves and see if there's yellowing or what else can you see? Yeah, so uh, when plants have stress, in the end you see them coloring or uh, the signal of dying. Um, that is really what we as humans can uh, uh, can percept. Uh, and that's not, not really the interesting fact. It really happens when you go into the non-visible area, so the, like the infrared spectrum. There's already stuff, a lot of stuff happening there. If a plant is producing uh, less, is doing less photosynthetic, uh, less photosynthetic activity, uh, it generally 
produces uh, or reflects less infrared light. Uh, so that is one of the, the things you can see with a multi or hyperspectral camera system. Uh, so really detecting these patterns in the non-visible area of the light spectrum. So what kinds of things can you see and in which spectrum? Yeah, so we are, uh, our main goal is, is disease detection. So we're looking at really uh, specific diseases per, per plant, uh, telling farmers, okay, uh, this is happening at these plants. So they know exactly where to go, what to spray, um, and then to treat us very early. Other things are things such as nutrients. So are there plants who are deprived of nitrogen? Uh, these are typical things you can you can look at with this uh, light reflective technology. Well, okay. Um, is it continuous monitoring, or do you do it once a day, or how often do you need to? Yeah, so now uh, uh, for uh, for most of these applications, we just do it once once a day. Uh, so you have one measurement of a day. You can over time see uh, what is happening. Uh, for example, these, these diseases, they can grow really fast, but it's not that they are affecting within 10 minutes. These are somewhat gradual processes. So inspecting once a day is, uh, is more than sufficient. And it's for the farmers like having someone who is just doing the, the, the inspection on a daily basis. So, again, what, what do you see in the different spectrums? What do you see in the visible versus infrared versus other spectrums? Any particulars? Uh, well, so you need the entire spectrum to, to tell something about the plan. It, it, uh, it is not saying, okay, uh, infrared one says something about this and green says something about that. Um, I, I hope, only can hope it would, it would be so simple. Um, each parameter is like a combination, it's like a, a, a pattern. We call them uh, optical fingerprints. So, for example, a, a certain disease can have a, some colors in the infrared combined with some yellows or some green. And if plants then show a uh, decreasing in the blue signal, uh, then that is typically a fingerprint of that disease. So it really it, it is about trying to figure out the different color patterns within the, the spectrum uh, and see what deviations uh, cause these, uh, these stress-free plants. What about during the day and the night? Have you ever observed plants, you know, in the morning versus the afternoon or at night? And, you know, how does that change things? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, good question. Um, there, from my biological, I have a background in biology, and from my perspective, uh, from my background in biology, uh, I can tell you that a lot of things change between the, during the day and the night. You have this, uh, uh, yeah, let's call it a day and a night photosynthesis. Uh, and generally, we, we look at the plant in the, during daylight. Um, then we can use the sun as our light source because the light that reflects has to come from somewhere. Um, and that is typically where we can see all the information about the plant itself. We have not really ventured into scanning by night. Um, there's no light, so you have to bring an artificial light. The, yeah, it, it, is, it is far more inconvenient, and it, the plants are behaving well, differently uh, to uh, stresses. So for us, it's really looking in the, in the daylight at uh, the plant. Well, how sensitive is the system? Do you have to look at it at the same time of day, or do you have a big window of time? Yeah, we, we calibrate for the, uh, uh, for the time of the data acquisition. But typically, uh, in the morning, just like us humans, uh, plants behave uh, differently than in the afternoon and in the evening. Uh, but when you collect a lot of data about all these differences, then you can really calibrate for this stuff. And if you monitor a plant in the morning and by the end of the day you come to the other side of the field, you can still use those both measurements to compare them. Well, just using the spectral imaging, I'm sure you see a lot of variation in the plants naturally, never mind disease. So what kinds of things have you learned by observing so far? Uh, well, uh, so actually, um, especially with the greenhouse cultivation, you see that these farmers, they are uh, they are really taking it to the next level. Uh, sometimes we, like in nature, you say, okay, there are so many variabilities, so many differences, and still these farmers manage it to, to have this super homogeneous quality and plant activity over their entire field. Um, and it's something, okay, this is too good. The data cannot be, cannot be valid. And then you go into the field, you check it, you validate it. It's okay. So really, and this is especially for greenhouse cultivation, this is really... Uh, 
really the the, the state of the art way of uh, of uh, of agriculture. And the other thing is, if you go outside, if you go into the the, the normal, if you would say, a type of agriculture, that is really well, one farm cannot be compared to the other farm. So we started out saying, okay, we done a, we tested our technology at this farm, but probably will deliver it to this other farmer this and this and this and this um, because from our experience. But even from the Netherlands, if you're in the top part, in the more, more southern part, it really makes a lot of difference. We went to France, for example, for the viticulture, for the wine growers, and there's even within a couple of kilometers, there's so much variability in uh, climate, microclimate conditions, in soil types, in all these different factors that, that you have to take into account. Um, yeah, that was re- that was really, we really didn't expect it to be that, uh, that there was so much difference even within uh, small regions. That is actually a great challenge for farmers to then within such a region to really make a homogeneous uh, result in the end, to deliver a quality but, and a, a certain type of quality over years. But at the same time, you said they're doing it. I mean, it's succeeding, and you're surprised about how homogeneous their product is. So they must be succeeding yeah, despite this. Yeah, so the, the greenhouses, that, that's what I'm talking about, oh, these super homogeneous uh, uh, fields, that is something, okay, that was that was above our expectations, and this is, this is super top-notch, and of course, that you go with greenhouse cultivation, but then going outside, that actually so there's so much more variability than we thought. So it's, it's actually these two extremes. It is either you have super much variability, uh, or you have the super neat <laughs> overall quality. And it so, is greenhouse mm-hmm. versus uh, outside uh, cultivation. So your goal is to make uh, greenhouse growing as similar as possible, or outside growing as homogeneous as greenhouse growing, hopefully, right? Yeah. So when when we go to an outside, well, let's go to an outside farmer, <laughs> an outside farm, open an aerial farm. Um, that is really a chance. Okay, can we help these farmers get more insight and all these variabilities? Because every plant in their field is responding differently to to the uh, to the climate, to stresses, to drought, those kind of things. Really giving them the data to have better decisions. In the, okay, so the other side with the green, yeah, yeah. Go, oh, go ahead, go ahead. So with the, with the greenhouses, it's a totally different story because all plants are so similar. If one plant is, uh, catches a disease, because greenhouses are just are just open, uh, a, a a fungus can really just fly into the greenhouse just like it can do with other fields. Um, because they're so similar, uh, it's like having a, a daycare where one kid has the flu. Uh, well, <laughs> in in one day, all kids will have the flu in the end. So with these uh, greenhouse farmers, which have super uh, homogeneous quality, they are also super uh, sensitive to the disease. So barely actually it's okay being there as soon as possible. When we see the first sign of, of, of the seeds, when we can see the first sign of the flu, uh, really treat that specific plant uh, before it spreads out over the entire uh, greenhouse. So what kinds of interesting things have you seen from your imaging that weren't seen before? Give me some uh, maybe case studies or examples. Yeah, so, uh, uh, well, the general thing is that a plant can, can look green and another plant can look as green, but still the, the first plant can be entirely healthy and the second one is is already on a very severe stage of uh, of infect of disease infection. Uh, so sometimes we see it up to three weeks um, before it's visible to the human eye that that plant is already uh, well infected and well at a certain stage of uh, of a disease. Uh, and this is really uh, well what we are as a company are uh, are, are trying to help farmers with. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in the example where both plants are totally green to the you know, visible spectrum, do you see something maybe in infrared or how can you tell that one has a problem? Does it have an unusual coloration in another spectrum or what are you seeing? Yeah, so um, our, our human eye can perceive three colors. Uh, we, the eye is actually a spectral sensor and we can see the, the red, the green and the blue. Uh, we have three receptors, actually three different color receptors. And in the hyperspectral sensor, you have like 150 of these sensors, of these receptors ranging from the blue to the green to the red, 
all the way to the infrared. So we the, the hyperspectral sensor can see 10 different kinds of red, 10 different kinds of blue, 10 different kinds of infrared, which gives you a lot more information about, about what is happening. Um, you can compare it with, for example, bees. Bees have, just as humans, red, green, and blue receptors in their, in their eye, their feathers. Um, but they also have a separate UV receptor. And with that inf bit of information, they can see, ah, this, this leaf is attractive for me to, to pollinate, and this one is not. It's the same principle we use with our hyperspect imager that has so many different types of bands. Um, it just generates much more information about uh, the object of the band, which we as humans cannot perceive. Uh, and especially general in the infrared, Something where we, as humans cannot cannot see any anything in. But right. That's happening a lot. Uh, if 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 you would have the vision or to see in the infrared, the ability to see in the infrared, the world would so, look so much different. All the objects would have different properties, and that will tell you something about what the status of their of the property is. Well, for instance, um, you know, you might be able to tell when a, a field that needs to be pollinated is ready for bees to come pollinate it. And let's say, you know, like someone's bringing by bees that are mobile, you know, to pollinate a field, they would know exactly when to bring them. And they might even know when a field is finished, you know, when it's been uh, pollinated, and it's time for the bees to go and move on. So maybe your imaging could do something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, so still, you have to know about what are these patterns, what do they tell you? Uh, so it's really for us to help you to, to try to find out, okay, what is interesting for the farmer? Can we perceive it? What patterns do correlate to that type of, of, of property of the object, of the plant? Uh, and then, as you mentioned, okay, how can you then use this in a day-to-day -day application? Mm. And what we're now see seeing with, with growing agriculture, like there's a growing demand for food, so uh, there's a bit, these small farms disappear and everything goes in large, big farms. Uh, well, if there's a disease there, it's like with the kindergarten example, uh, then all plants will, are very receptive of getting that disease and the less yield. You have to spray more chemicals, which is really, really looking for the environment. Uh, so for us, that is just application number one, trying to prevent outbreaks for, uh, from diseases and monitoring them in a very early stage. Well, what about looking at the uptake of, um, you know, uh, nutrients after a spraying or the uptake of pesticide or, you know, in a hydroponic situation, you know, the uptake of nutrients and that kind of stuff. I mean, it seems like since this seems to be so poorly understood, the patterns and all that, I mean, it seems like the best thing to do maybe is to study what's normal first. Study what goes on in greenhouses, you know, diurnally and see the variation and then, you know, see what happens when you're fed nutrients and when you introduce deliberately a pest and that kind of stuff. And then it can be extrapolated to the field a lot easier. No, no, of course. So uh, uh, the company now is uh, uh, existing, uh, existing now for two and a half years. So we, we took all those steps, right? So we, uh, we uh, first went into the lab, do it at very experimental basis, then try to extrapolate it to a field situation then go from the bare minimum, okay, what is a normal plant? How can we modify, how, what can we do to, can we give it less nutrients? Can we just, uh, you know, give them water for like two weeks? What happens then? Uh, so this is the information you need up front, and that's what we've been working on in the last couple of years. Uh, and now really at the stage of saying, okay, uh, we have our validation, we have our technology, and mm. now we need to help these farmers in a real life situation. Is there anything you've seen that really surprised you that you were like amazed to see? You know, any phenomena under different spectra or different phenomena that you were, you know, you were able to see? Uh, so uh, uh, plants are very uh, um, are very responsive to different kinds of things in nature. Uh, sometimes within within minutes, a plant can uh, can already start. If it's in the, in the shadow, you, you see it immediately. Um, it, it's within it's within minutes. Um, so, in general, the growing of plants is a very well long and slow process. Uh, but there's so much more ha happening within the plant on uh, on on minute to minute basis, um, which is really surprising. So, uh, to give a more practical example, watering a plant uh, 
like with 10 liters, for example, 10 liters a day, or watering the plant 10 times one liter, uh, 10 times per day one liter, can really make a, a, a huge difference. It's not that not that this plant is like, okay, just need so many water a day. No, it, it really is on sometimes on on, on our level uh, that you need to steer to get the optimal result. Um, where, and where a lot of farmers are not at that level yet, it's just okay. If it's dry, if it's dry, if there's a lot of drought, yeah, we just spray. Um, but I think with new technologies such as ours arriving, we go into a situation where this process is much more data driven. And maybe in the end, uh, even farming is getting more of a white collar job than a blue collar job. Okay. So to say that that in the end, the farmer just looks at the input. Okay what is objectively measured, and then I can combine those data with my skills as, as a grower um, and then apply the best method. So what do you see as the need? Do you think continuous monitoring will be a big step up from once a day? Do you think it's necessary or once a day is enough? Does that make it you know, cost prohibitive or data prohibitive? Yeah, so I think the, the best way is, is to monitor things over time. So really say, okay, if I have sprayed, what is the effect? Uh, so not only measuring, okay, there's a, a specific drought or there's a drought now, but then do the action and then again do the monitoring uh, to see what is the effect uh, in the plant itself. So we uh, believe that a continuous monitoring uh, system is uh, very beneficial. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. I guess there'll be that trade-off. <laughs> no, I guess there'll be, like I said, there'll, there'll be that trade-off between... Uh, Continuous monitoring would generate a ton more data, but you'd be able to see things faster and react faster, but it probably will cost a lot more. And then once a day monitoring for cheaper, a lot less data, but maybe you won't catch things in time. That's why I'm saying that, you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so it, 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 and then it comes down to read, okay, what is it that you're trying to see? Um, right. right, so uh, are things happening on the spot? Then of course it needs to be continuous, um, but if such a process is, is taking taking a bit more time, then then you could generally see that within, uh, within a day. Mm. Okay. Are there any other uh, measurements that you want to do in the near future? Uh, is sound play any role? Um, any other types of measurements important? Well, um, saying that spectral imaging is uh, the one true answer, I think, is not uh, <laughs> is not really the case. It is, it is one type of sensor and one type of information. Um, for us, we really focus on, on this technology, and we are one of the few players in the world actually working on, on this specific technology. Um, but in the end, you also want to integrate like weather stations, uh, artificial intelligence for predictive modeling, and okay, what is being measured up today? Uh, can we already predict what it will be tomorrow? Just like, just like we do with the weather report, right. uh, we know what the weather is going to be in 14 days, sort of. Doesn't always decide, but you can already try to prepare if it's going to rain in ten days. Um, so that is that is for us. That's the, the next thing. Uh, not measuring what is what is there currently or what the seeds have been uh, are active in the field. Really, okay. What is the chance that I can get this stress of in the near future? Can I monitor my conditions now that say something about future stress yield? You name it. Okay. Well, listen, very good. So what's the best way for people to learn more about uh, Polarix and to get in contact and ask questions? Yeah, uh, well, we have we have a website and we uh, actually are now uh, trying to make it a bit more uh, informative and a bit more nicer, but uh, <laughs> things are on our way. Um, people can always uh, contact us via the social media, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Facebook, we're also active. We have a newsletter for people who are interested to just do on a monthly basis. Just some, some general updates. We, we never try to, to spam people, but more like, hey, we're working on this, and uh, yeah, just, to, just, just to give people an update. So, so this, these are really channels. If people are interested, uh, then uh, then find us at Polarix or uh, Google Polarix uh, uh, dot com. Uh, where you can find us really easily. Uh, and if you're ever around in Norway, then. Well, we have very nice coffee here, so uh, oh, man. we're always open to the sweet chat. <laughs> or we can also do a wine from one of our uh, area growers. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Well, thanks for, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it, and 
it'll be interesting to see what uh, what comes of this in the near future. Yeah, I'll keep you uh, keep you up to date. Thanks for having the conversation. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.